Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to week two of the online John Howard Society National Staff Conference. I introduced myself last week, but uh, if you weren't here, my name is Liz Vick. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives. I'm based with the John Howard Society here in Vancouver. This week, we are very pleased to have a team from UBC's Collaborating Center for Prison Health Education, one of our national JHS partners. The team today will be presenting their project on the relationship between trauma and incarceration. And it's very relevant to be discussing this topic, given the global resistance we are seeing to systemic racism and what we know are poorer outcomes for Black, Indigenous, and people of color when they must interact with the criminal justice system. The format today will be a presentation from the team. And if you have questions about the presentation during the, the session, please submit them in the right-hand side column, and the team will answer as many as possible after the presentation finishes. So with that, I will hand over to the team. Hope you enjoy the session. Are the co-sailors, are the co-sailors, Muskegon and Swale, two people? Let me try that again. Swale the two people and swale the two people. Where we're trying to help all uh, the, the fathers, the sons, the brothers out there regain their their life after incarceration, and then we do it in such a good way that we're going to reach as many people as possible. All my relations. That's great. Thanks for that, Richard. And I think it's a really important thing to mention that we want to build on that acknowledgement and follow it up with actions and work to sort of help make things better and help address all the inequities existing in this world and the challenges that um, Indigenous men have to face because of colonization and the legacy that comes with that. So I'd like to introduce this this uh, talk and the, the title of this project is Trauma at the Root, Exploring Paths to Healing with Formerly Incarcerated Men. And I'd also like to acknowledge the generous funding provided by the Vancouver Foundation and Health Canada's Substance Use and Addiction Research Program. Um, hi everyone, my name is Chris Richardson. I'm a scientist at the Center for Health Evaluation Outcome Sciences at St. Paul's Hospital and also a research associate with the School of Population Public Health at UBC. And my name is Kate Ross. I'm the project coordinator for this project. I've been with the Collaborating Center for Prison Health and Education for just over four years now. Uh, my background is actually in anthropology, um, but you know, overall I find a lot of uh, similarities in the research process. Uh, between uh, anthropology and what we're doing here, so that's great. And you know, everything I've learned about prison health. I've, I've learned uh, through my work here and through getting to work with great people like Chris and with Richard especially. So uh, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, Richard? Hello, my name is Richard Teague. I'm formerly from Edmonton. Uh, after spending many years in prison as a young man, uh, I became a drug addict. And when I cleaned up in 2008, I wanted to share my vast experience with men and women that are still suffering in the downtown east side. So I've been down there doing this work, uh, especially with the Dudes Club. I've been with them for 10 years and uh, other support groups. And uh, especially UBC, I've been with them since about 2016, helping them with their work. And uh, it's, it's been uh, very uh, good for me. I love I loved working with Kate and Chris. And hopefully we're going to build a good resource at the end of this project where many men are, are going to benefit from. Thank you. Okay, now that we've done our introductions, I'm just going to provide a brief outline of the presentation. We're going to begin with an overview where Kate's going to describe the Collaborating Center for Prison Health and Education uh, located within the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. And after that, we'll go over a bit of background around trauma and how it influences functioning 
And that's really one of the core pillars of this work that we're doing. And from there, we'll move into more of an overview of the project and how we're building on all the research on trauma and how we can incorporate it to support men with a history of incarceration. Um, we're gonna go over key activities that we're doing uh, through this project and then talk about some of the resources that we're planning to develop. So these are sort of the outputs or the key deliverables that will stem from this project that we're hoping uh, people like you will use through your work with men at the John Howard Society. And after that, we're going to open it up for some live uh, Q&A and discussion. And really, we're looking forward to hearing what you think. We're going to try and answer any questions you have. And really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you on what you think about the work we're doing and how it might help the John Howard Society. Yeah, so um, the Collaborating Center for Prison Health and Education, or CCPHE, as Chris mentioned, is located at UBC in the School of Population and Public Health. Um, it was established in 2006 by Dr. Ruth Elwood Martin. Um, she's been working as a, or had been working as a physician for over 15 years inside prison. Um, and, you know, really saw a need to create a center that focuses on the health and well being of people who are either incarcerated or have previously been incarcerated and are transitioning back into the community. Um, all the projects that we work on are community based and participatory. Uh, we incorporate a partnership approach to all of the research and programming that we do, which means we work with an academic team. We have a project team um, that includes either incarcerated people or people who have previously been incarcerated, um, as well as working with community organizations. Um, when we talk about health, we use a broad uh, interpretation of health. Uh, which includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Um, this iceberg image here um, was created during a previous project and is a great illustration of this big picture health idea. So, you know, it represents health issues that are above the surface, so things that we can see, uh, you know, cancer, bloodborne infections, experiences of addiction. But you know, it also really goes into the factors that impact health that lie beneath the surface. So you have system complexities, uh, you know, feeling judged, feelings of stigma, and then right at the very base of that is trauma, um, which is the focus of this project. So now I just want to provide a little background about the relationship between trauma and incarceration. Um, First of all, research has shown that there's a really high prevalence of trauma among incarcerated populations, and at least 50% um, report a history of childhood sexual, physical, and or emotional abuse. And you can also think that being incarcerated in and of itself is being seen by some researchers and advocates as a form of trauma, that all the stress and the threatening environment and what goes on while being arrested and while in while being incarcerated can sort of act as a traumatic experience and have some of the same impacts as other forms of traditional trauma that come to mind um, another important point to think think about and just really remember is that males make up about 80 percent of custody in provincial settings and about 92 percent of custody in federal settings so We've really got to think that gender plays a really important role when, when thinking about how to support people who have been incarcerated. Um, one other point we want to, want to discuss and we always want to think about is the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in Canadian prisons. While there is a slight trend towards um, reductions in the number of people being, being incarcerated, we're seeing actually an increase in the, the extent to which Indigenous people, the proportion of in people in prison who are indigenous. And in a sense, you can see this, you can almost think about it as an extension of residential schools in that the system is sort of sucking up people into prisons at a higher rate among indigenous populations. So that overrepresentation is just getting bigger for indigenous people in Canadian prisons. And the last point I wanna briefly discuss is there's a lot of evidence and support and I'm sure as, as as people who work directly with men with history of incarceration, the close links between trauma and substance use and incarceration. Many people are, are incarcerated for substance use either directly or indirectly. So it's either activities related to substance use that lead them to be incarcerated. And that there's overwhelming evidence about the close relationship between both childhood and more recent trauma 
and the use of substances, often as a means of coping, and then that coping sort of evolves over time into sort of much more problematic substance use, and we're going to be going over that relationship shortly. But those are some key background issues that we need to think and really consider carefully as we go through this research. Now I just want to provide a bit of background on the process of trauma. And um, I'd just like to mention that the clinical experts on a team who have a, a lot of experience working with trauma, especially among men, have been very clear to say that not all traumas stem from one or more extremely negative, intense, overwhelming events that lead to the development of a clinical condition such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Rather, the experience of traumatic stressors in childhood and adolescence, as well as in adulthood, can impact emotional and physical functioning later in life in a range of ways, particularly in the way people respond to stressful situations. And these don't all meet the classic um, clinical definition of post-traumatic stress disorder. The nature and intensities of these impacts can vary greatly from individual to individual. And this more nuanced approach is gaining a lot of traction, especially among researchers working with indigenous communities, where there's a lot of interest in sort of theories of complex PTSD and historic trauma. Now, these frameworks take into account more complex effects that come from chronic exposure to a range of traumatic stressors over time. They also extend beyond the experience of individuals to reflect the impact of experience on communities of people. And where it's really gaining a lot of interest is studying the impact of colonization on generations of indigenous people in Canada. So, so this more nuanced approach is really looking to see how trauma affects different populations and different individuals in their own unique way. Now in the diagram, the first point I want to go through or the first step is generally thought of as some sort of traumatic event. And it has to be quite intense and it has to overwhelm or be really impactful and sort of really challenge all the coping and resources that someone might have. And what this 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 challenge does, it, it can trigger a, re a response. And these are broken into usually three categories, fight, flight, or freeze. And these responses come with altered states of consciousness, body sensations, um, we, we hear of numbing. Um, we also hear of hypervigilance, hyperarousal. And then the other end of the spectrum, we hear total collapse where the body and brain just give up and say, look, it's less stressful for me just to give up and let everything happen to me without trying to process anything. Now this, the experience of a traumatic event and the response to that traumatic event leads to sensitized, sensitized um, nervous systems that, that can be really, really sensitive and pick up um, experiences. It also leads, it leads to changes in the brain and you sort of have these pathways and responses to how the brain responds to stimuli. And it also changes links between the brain body. So you get these connections between the physical body and thoughts and emotion. Now, what happens once these pathways and the sensitized nervous system have been established as a result of the traumatic experience and the response of that trauma, those, those changes in the brain and body maintain long after that traumatic event. And what can happen is psychological and physical distress long after those events um, can trigger emotional or physical responses. So these, these triggers might be a stressful situation. It might be distinct reminders of trauma. So it could be walking down a street in, a, in the same location or in a very uh, similar location. It could be sensations like smell, noise, lights. It can be images, so from a movie, or it could be certain behaviors that sort of trigger that, 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 that emotional response. Um, it can be a certain emotional state, and it can be just really distinct memories of, of events. And what these triggers or, or states do is they trigger really intense emotional and physical responses. And they can be in the form of um, what clinicians call retreat. So people might experience a trigger or a really stressful situation, and, and the emotional or physical response can be in the form of retreat. They can go into isolation. They can go so far as dissociating. Um, you can have depression and anxiety. Another set of um, emotional and physical responses is related to harmful behavior to self. So this can be substance use disorders, eating disorders, deliberate self-harm and suicidal actions. And substance use in particular is often used as sort of a way to manage 
the uh, the consequences of trauma. And at some points early on, maybe it is the only effective tool they have to get through the day and manage um, the sequelae of traumatic experiences. But in the long term, it can be very damaging. Um, another bundle of responses involves harmful behavior to others, aggression, violence, rages, and threats. And again, people that have been through trauma, sometimes their brain learns that the only way they got through that trauma is to respond really aggressively and really violently. And they, their brain learns that sort of hypervigilant and quick response to any threat. And maybe they didn't respond that way when they were going through traumatic events, but that past experience triggers almost a protection, a a violent response to any threat and it's without really cognitive processing it's almost automatic automated and can get them in a lot of trouble it means it's self-protective really primal response to threat or stress and lastly there are physical health, health issues related to lung disease heart disease and, and obesity so these constant sort of elevations in heart rate in response to stressful situations or reminders of past traumas it can set the heart racing, it leads to contraction of blood vessels, so it contributes to heart disease, it can influence metabolic pathways and contribute to obesity. We're just starting to understand these things. So as you can see, it's really a complex process, and the important point is that it's really a nuanced thing to look at, and, and it, the impact really varies from one person to another, and trying to figure out how they can pick the pieces that really relate to their situation and identify how they want to go forward and sort of develop and improve the way they cope with uh, stressful situations in the future is the key and something we're trying to do with this project. Okay, so now that we've um, talked a bit about the process of trauma um, and the extent we talked previously about how common it is among uh, men with a history of incarceration, we're just going to talk a bit about the response to that situation and one of the things that that has come about is this this concept or this approach called trauma-informed practice and really what this um, researchers and frontline workers and various counselors and clinicians sort of came up with this idea that because of the extent to which um, they see people with trauma and how it affects how they respond to stress and stressful situations and those might even be people trying to help them they develop these principles of what's called trauma-informed practice. And really, the, this type of practice aims to identify trauma and its symptoms of, among, among people. So in this case, it would be inmates or formerly incarcerated men. So really having staff being able, being aware and be able to notice the signs of trauma and, and, and it shows up by how they might respond to stress, how they might be hypervigilant or how they might self-isolate or really retreat from situations. So just having staff recognize and be able to see those signs. Um, the other part of uh, trauma-informed practice is sort of to train staff to understand how the experience of trauma can impact how people respond to stress. And really part of this is to help them provide supports to people and tailor the way they interact with people. And this is an effort to, they don't want to re-traumatize people. So you might interpret someone's reactions as, oh, well, they're getting really aggressive to me, and then you might call security, and, and then in a sense, you could almost re-traumatize someone, or you might ask someone out of good intentions to start, oh, well, that seems like it's really bothering you, and start talking to them about re-traumatic things happening in the past, and just talking about those experiences could re-traumatize them. And again, you're trying to sort of maintain sensitivity to triggers of trauma and understand how traumatic dynamics without intent may play out in different settings and whether they be prisons, halfway houses, or out in the community. So again, understanding how all that plays out, but really focused on training the staff. Um, there's a broader concept of trauma practice that has these sort of four guiding principles. And this was developed by Nancy Poole um, over at BC Children's and Women, and includes these four sort of guiding principles. And this is sort of the approach we're taking. What Nancy and her team has done, they included a, a guiding principle of trauma awareness. So this is sort of one of the foundations of our projects, as that trauma and awareness includes understanding the impact of trauma on one's own development and the adaptation of substance use as a coping mechanism. So really our workshops and our resource will really work with men to help them understand how past traumatic experiences might affect their own development and how it might have influenced their 
use of substances as, as a coping mechanism, not in a judgmental way, but just is in a way of understanding why that might have happened and why it might continue to happen without any judgment. And again, that's a little different from just training staff. It's seen as a complement to staff. So that trauma awareness, not just among staff, but also among our clients. The second core principle is emphasis on safety and trustworthiness. So that many people with trauma experience have also experienced uh, abuses of power and unsafe relationships. So really, it's important to sort of understand how, how important it is to, when working with people who have experienced with experience trauma, to have trusting relationships and, and relationships that are safe for people to, to engage in. And that cannot be emphasized enough. And you'll see later on as we talk about this project, this is where the use of peers really plays out because we don't wanna put people in positions where they feel a sense of power or lack of safety. And you can see how in the settings of incarceration or uh, halfway houses in the community, that power imbalance might really be played out in, um, in ways that aren't helpful. Another important principle is opportunity for choice, collaboration, and connection. And this notion that self-determination and personal control are really important, especially for formerly incarcerated men, as they've gone through a past where they had limited agency and decision-making abilities. And so trying to work with them to give them that sense of choice, collaboration, and connection is really important. And in some ways, if you don't do that, you can really turn them off. So having that choice, collaboration, and connection combined with that safety and trustworthiness is a way to build and engage men. Um, and it's not a top-down, learn this, do this, but we want to work with you to figure out how this might work for you. And it involves choice, collaboration, connection. And this is important. Um, this is why, an important reason why we took this community-based participatory approach, which Kate will uh, go on to discuss later. And the last sort of important guiding principle of our work is strength space and skill building. And again, this is critical. One of the cornerstones of this project is um, having a resilience and component. So how can guys learn from the content we go through? And one of the last set of modules is all about resilience and how to foster that. So it's not a deficit based, you've got this, you've got this, it's hopeless. It's like, no, you learn how to do this and you could learn how to do other things. There is a strength based approach to learning and understanding how you can work with your situation and move forward in a positive way. And this is both um, is embodied in the way we've developed this resource in a co-developed form um, with people like Richard and many of the other men involved in this project and also how we plan to deliver this resource and really how we're designing it um, through say peer-led projects and workshops. Okay, now I'd like to just talk about um, how trauma and the experience of trauma and how we might support people in sort of learning how to um, manage its impact on their lives plays out um, across gender. Traditionally, a lot of research has been, on, has been done on trauma in women or trauma in people um, who have gone through a lot, of, a lot of abuse as children and, and that often in the past has been women. But more recently, more recently, there's been a lot of interest in how trauma affects men. And a bit of a neglected population. So on our team, we have David Cool, a psychologist who does a lot of work with military veterans and first responders who experience trauma, and a clinical counselor, Jesse Frender, who has worked extensively with, with uh, men who have experienced trauma, and a professor, um, by, uh, John Olaf, who's worked on gender and masculinity and health. And these three um, co-investigators are really gurus in gender, and it's particularly with men working with men and, and, and how their emotions and psychological functioning influence their health. So what we can see, it, it's, it's, you can see how gender really plays out among formerly incarcerated men. It's a really important lens to look through how trauma might affect men. In the prison setting, sort of, we have what's called this theory of toxic masculinity. This, this sort of male cultural norm of being strong and aggressive and not showing emotions and putting up a brave front are sort of really emphasized in a, in a setting of incarceration or in community settings where there's, there might be a lot of violence is that men, those responses, these sort of toxic masculinity responses are really emphasized and become an important survival strategy. Um, and this plays out because these are these very responses that may have, may have been important mechanisms that helped them get through and survive traumatic events in the past may in current 
situations in the community prevent them from getting help or lead to problems in how they integrate back into society in a healthy way. So trying to understand how that plays out from this notion of a men's perspective and how toxic masculinity plays out, especially given the history of incarceration among men is really important. Yeah, moving on to the project overview. As Chris said, this project is titled Trauma at the Root, Exploring Paths to Healing with Formerly Incarcerated Men. Uh, we're funded by Vancouver Foundation as well as Health Canada's Substance Use and Addictions Program. John Howard Society of Canada is our community partner. Uh, and this is a five-year project that we're right in the middle of that runs until March, 2023. Now, just to take a little look at the whole team involved. Um, so in our project team, in addition to Chris, Richard, and myself, we're also working with Wenda Williams, who is a recognized Indigenous community leader in Vancouver based out of the Sayust Center. Um, Jesse Frender is a counselor who uh, has lots of experience working with men and trauma. Um, does a lot of work in kind of specific groups, so working with veterans, working with firefighters. Um, and then we're also working with Jeff Topham, who is a photographer and filmmaker. Uh, he's worked with us on a number of previous projects and well, as well. And actually, Richard introduced him to us uh, through his work at Dudes Club. Um, and then we have a great research team working with us as well. So we have Catherine Latimer, uh, who is our community partner. Then Ruth, as we mentioned, um, you know, she developed CCPHE and extensive experience working with people uh, incarcerated or people who have previously been to prison. Uh, John Olaf, out of the Faculty of Nursing at UBC, uh, really specializes in men's mental health, um, also has um, quite a bit of experience uh, using photo voice as a method. Uh, David Cool, um, who actually introduced us to Jesse, um, and yeah, his focus, his expertise is really trauma-related research um, and creating trauma um, workshops specifically for different groups of men. So as I mentioned, uh, veterans and firefighters. Uh, Jane Buxton uh, does amazing work with peers and uh, focusing on harm reduction. Um, then uh, Fiona Kumjin out of McMaster uh, does work on the health status of people who have been incarcerated. And then Nicole Myers out of Queens um, has a criminology background and, you know, looks at people's interactions with the criminal justice system. So the overall goal of this project is really uh, strength based. So, you know, we want to foster resilience among men who have been incarcerated and equip them with a greater capacity to manage traumatic stress and its relationships to substance use. And then within that, we have two major objectives. One, you know, we want to improve our understanding of how men who have been incarcerated uh, perceive the effects of trauma on their relationships. Um, on their incarceration experiences, reintegration experiences, and just overall on their help-seeking behavior. And then the second objective of the project is co-developing this health literacy resource, which will increase trauma and resilience awareness um, for men who have been incarcerated. So within that, the project has some key activities. We have preliminary focus groups, um, a trauma and resilience awareness workshop, a participatory photography project that we call Photo Voice. Um, and then we want to co-develop and pilot the health literacy resource. So we'll go through each of these activities um, in a little more detail as we go on. Um, but I just want to reiterate again that, you know, we're using a community-based participatory research approach, CBPR, um, through all of our activities. And, you know, what that means is having strong connections to community, as we said, focusing on strength-based approaches. And that really, you know, works to amplify men's voices throughout the project. And, you know, Richard has really played a huge role in this and has really helped make the project um, a success as it's been so far. So I think I'll just hand it over to Richard now to talk a little bit about the work that he's done on the project. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, since I cleaned up in 2008, I've been involved supporting my community, the downtown east side. And a big part of it was the Dudes Club, where we meet every two weeks. We usually get 40 or 50 guys. Well, that's before COVID-19 anyways. And uh, a lot of the men that come to our group 
had very similar backgrounds as me. They've been traumatized. They've been in jail. They're, they're still uh, dealing with substance abuse issues. But uh, I built a lot of trust with these men. So when this uh, part come up with our project with UBC, where we needed to do some focus groups, uh, I was because of the trust that I had with the men, I was able to get enough men together to fill a couple uh, focus groups for us, so we can get some background on uh, on their their history and uh, direct us in the right direction for our, for our research. So. It's because of my connection with my community and, and the trust that I built with the men that go there. It gives a lot of them know my background, you know, prison abuse, substance abuse, and they know I've made changes. So that gives them a, a little thought that, you know, well, if Richard can do it, maybe I can too. Um, so as Richard uh, mentioned previously, um, we have gone through um, a series of uh, four focus groups between April and June, and we were uh, midway or not quite midway through a photo voice project, but based on the the um, the focus groups, we've got some preliminary information, and we just like to share. So the focus groups are interesting. They started with a timeline activity where people sort of drew a timeline, and just one end was today. This is where you are today, and the other point was where you were born, and they just wrote. Uh, specific events that happened in their lives that were really important and pivotal, either in positive and negative ways. It was a great way to start the groups. It was a way for guys to just reflect on their lives and write things down in a safe way as a first step that they could then share in subsequent discussion. And then that was followed by sort of a one hour, one and a half hour group discussion, a small group discussion. Um, Richard was there. We had Wendell, who's a very uh, respected First Nations leader in the community, who most of the men know, and Jesse, who led this discussion, who's a trained clinical counselor. So we did record all these sessions, and we looked at um, all the transcripts and analyzed them, and some of the key themes that have emerged that were really important to men sort of in overcoming stressors, day-to-day -day stressors, um, once they were out in the community, so once they we're no longer incarcerated and we're out in the community or in halfway houses um, trying to navigate reintegration. So the key themes that were associated with successful, like with success, once they're in the community, were sort of connecting to culture. And this was really important among our indigenous folks. 84% um, of the uh, people who joined the focus groups were, I mean, 72% identified, self-identified as indigenous. So that connecting culture came up repeatedly as really important. Another theme was finding purpose. And this was really interesting. Um, what a lot of the guys said, finding purpose, it wasn't just getting a job, but it was doing something meaningful. And it might just be helping people for no pay at all, but that finding purpose in their life, and it could be through work or through volunteering or just doing something meaningful and purpose was really important. And how they found that varied from guy to guy, but that was an important pivoting point and helped them um, sort of a key theme that would lead to sort of successful living reintegration. Keeping busy came up frequently, especially for those um, who had um, issues with substance use. Um, keeping busy, not having too much time to be sort of in your head came up several times. And just always having something to do um, and just the, the importance of that uh, just played out repeatedly. Another thing that came out was really interesting is quite a few of the men talked about there was a shift in their sort of perspective internally. And it wasn't a shift that sort of was like learning a skill. So going through a workbook and then all of a sudden the A plus B equals C and all of a sudden they were in a different place. It was something triggered a shift in how they looked at their situation and how they're gonna go forward. And it was that internal shift in perspective. It's almost like the penny dropped, we might say in lay language that we want to help promote. I mean, our workshop and resource won't drive that by itself, but the literacy and the learning that comes from it might provide men with some insight to understand their past experiences and how that influences their present behavior and connect the dots in a way that helps promote that shift in perspective and taking a more resilient strength-based approach going forward. And again, it would just be the start of that journey and hopefully the resources are in place that could support that and they will be in a position to take advantage of those resources. Another thing that came up was humor. It was repeatedly 
mentioned as a useful coping skill and that things are so tough sometimes you have to sit back and have a bit of sense of humor otherwise it's just too tough so having a sense of humor was really important and the last thing that came up repeatedly was the importance of connecting to peers and connecting to people that you trust both in socializing but also in any sort of help seeking or resource seeking having trusted people that you could talk to and peers came up a lot because they, I think the phrase they understand or they get it, um, where some people you might ask for resources from don't get it. The importance of peers or um, support workers that understand what they had been through and connecting to them and navigating things was really important. And also for social reasons too. Having, being with people who understood where you were coming from was really important. Um, so I'll just pass things over to Richard if you want to comment on any of these things from your perspective, Richard. Yeah, well, uh, working with the Dudes Club, uh, I've been doing it for 10 years, and a lot of people know my history of incarceration, drug abuse, recovering addict. So I, uh, I, a lot of men have trust in what I say, and they believe in what I say. So when this project come up with UBC, and we're looking for people to do workshops, uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, are you going to be there? So yes, I'm going to be there. So what Chris was saying that come, come up as part of our results, people need to feel safe and they need to feel that they can trust who they're speaking with. So I was uh, sitting on these uh, projects and a lot of men were always looking at me when questions were answered. But uh, these were important for our research to find and listen to other people's history. What worked for them to get them to where they are? A lot of it was culture, uh, trust, and uh, finding uh, a purpose in life. I know when I cleaned up, I had to find a purpose or I would have went crazy because like Chris, I mentioned before, you don't want to spend too much time in your head. You need to find a purpose when you get up in the morning. And this is what I need to do. And I think a lot of that come out in our uh, our uh, meetings with the guys. But I was fortunate that I had the connection with the dudes club that a lot of people had faith and trust in me that they're willing to, to get on board and and share some of their stories. And uh, I'm, I think that's what made our focus groups uh, useful for our research. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that, Richard. And I think people can hear your voice creating that, that atmosphere that this is non-judgmental, like whatever you've been through, it worked for you to get you through to today and you're alive and you're, you're doing okay. As, I mean, you're still alive. You've got a lot of choices and opportunities ahead. It's just figuring out how to take advantage and move forward. Um, and I think we learned very quickly that having that sense of trust and having people like Richard involved was key to guys engaging with this work. Um, some of the guys, you know, the phrases that came up is what we don't want is another workshop or workbook to get all programmed up because quite a few of the, some of the guys in our workshops had gone through uh, required programming as part of being a violent offender or something like that about managing emotions. But what they said is because it was a forced thing that to go and tick a tick box, they didn't seem to engage. And some of them had been through multiple times and maybe after the third or fourth time, something clicked. But they said a key part is going through that process with someone they trust and whether it's a peer or a worker or a nurse that they really connected with, that seemed to make a huge difference in terms of their engagement with their material and them sort of thinking about it and pulling out the pieces that might work for them and help contribute to that, that, that shift in internal perspective that guys mentioned. That was key. If we can help make that happen by just providing information in a trusting way that they can pick the pieces that maybe help inform them in a way that, uh, that sets up that shift in perspective that gives them purpose, that supports sort of a resilient strengths-based approach going forward. I think that's key to this project. And we're really excited. We think we've really stumbled onto something that, that, that has a lot of potential. So 
you know, looking at the remainder of the project and where we are now, um, we're right in the middle of delivering the trauma and resilience awareness workshop. Um, and we've also begun the photo voice component. So uh, we want to engage uh, up to 30 men in the workshop overall. We're about halfway there. We've run the workshop twice to 15 men. And then we've had to pause due to COVID. Uh, we'll run some additional workshops when it's safe to do so. Um, we're also planning on running two photo voice groups. So the first group is comprised of men from the first two workshops. Uh, we were able to hold about four sessions between February and March. And then when we're able to, we will have another few sessions with that group and then hold a full second group um, with men from the additional workshops. So, you know, we're hoping to get that completed all by the end of this year. Um, and then, yeah, the remainder of the project is really focused on developing and piloting um, the health literacy resource. So now I'll talk about the workshop um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so we've worked with Jesse, the counselor, to um, create this short, about an hour and a half long workshop titled Making Sense of Traumatic Stress and Resilience, a Primer for Formerly Incarcerated Men. Um, the main objectives of this workshop are to uh, provide some health education information, uh, begin to draw connections between substance use and trauma, um, and introduce guys to the concepts of trauma and resilience informed practice. Uh, so we've created uh, four major components, four sections of the workshop. So we start with describing what trauma and traumatic stress is and how it works. Then we move into discussing where trauma comes from and what actually causes traumatic stress. Uh, then the second half of the workshop moves into drawing connections between all of the health information um, into what that might actually mean for guys, you know, where they are now and how that fits into their lives overall. And then finally, we begin to discuss how we can develop resilience and um, how we can better manage traumatic stress in our lives. So the workshop is delivered by Jesse, uh, supported by Richard uh, Wendell, our Indigenous community leader. He was involved in the development of the workshop, but you know his time is in really high demand, so he participates when he can. But you know we do think it's really important um, his involvement in the workshop delivery as well. So uh, we're also doing some evaluation um, as we go with the workshop. So we have the guys fill out some pre and post surveys, um, and then we've also built in time for some small breaks as well as a larger break in the middle where we have a meal together. Um, so from start to finish, the whole thing takes about three hours to deliver. Um, so, so far we've hosted uh, one workshop on January 28th at the John Howard Community Service Office uh, drop-in space. And then we also hosted one on February 4th at the UBC Learning Exchange, uh, both centrally located in Vancouver. Um, we worked with Teddy Chan at John Howard to invite uh, peer support workers and John Howard clients to participate. And then Richard, again, did amazing work um, promoting the project, uh, promoting the workshop, and signing up participants through Dudes Club. Um, overall, we've delivered the workshop to 15 men so far. And as I said, we're intending to reach up to 30 men by the end. Um, overall, we've had a great response to the workshop. Um, we're collecting feedback from the men and you know they're telling us that they want to know more about um, the topics that we've introduced. And you know as the title says this workshop is really intended to be a primer on these topics um, and then with the intent that the actual resource that we develop is going to delve into each of these topics in more detail. So the men who participate in the workshop are then invited to um, explore these ideas a little bit further through this participatory photography component that we're calling photo voice. Um, just as a very broad definition, photo voice is the combination of photography and social action. Um, so photo voice really works to amplify the voices of people who don't normally get a say in policy decisions. So by providing them with cameras in order to, you know, document and share their life stories, they're able to share those stories with people who might not get to hear those things normally. So um, we see the workshop as an opportunity for participants, for guys to gain knowledge that is relevant to their lives or, you know, also the lives of other men that they know. 
And then the photo voice component is a little bit more of an active component. So it's an opportunity for the participants to, you know, really be able to express what that knowledge means to them and how it makes sense for them in their lives. Um, so we developed the curriculum, the photo voice curriculum with Jeff, the photographer. Um, and then over the course of several sessions, um, we're planning on five, but we've also uh, left room for it to be flexible if we need to add an extra session, if that feels right. So, you know, Jeff provides an introduction to photography basics, and then we go over how to actually use, ca use the cameras. So we provide everyone with a digital camera. Um, at the end of each session, the guys get a photo assignment, and then um, we discuss that assignment at the beginning of the next session. Um, so we share everyone's photos, and Jeff actually does some live editing in Photoshop um, of everyone's photos, which is kind of cool. Um, and then the final session will be a individual interview with each participant. Um, while they'll, they will speak to some of their photographs a little bit more specifically um, and in detail through an interview. So, so far we have seven guys, including Richard, um, who are participating in our first photo voice group. Um, we held our first session on February 21st at the UBC Learning Exchange. And then we met um, once a week uh, up until March 13th um, when we had to pause. So um, ultimately the project is gonna culminate in a public photography exhibit and then the photos and narratives and you know footage of the group sessions and the individual interviews are all gonna be compiled into a documentary a video about the project too. So, you know, overall we're having a great time. The men are really engaged with the photography process. Um, and we think, you know, we were really on our way to creating some great content for the exhibit. You know, we've lost a little bit of momentum due to COVID over from the first four sessions that we had, but, you know, we're keeping in contact with everyone and, you know, we're really hopeful that uh, we're going to be able to pick right back up where we left off as soon as it's safe for us to do so. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be running additional workshops. And then from those workshops, we'll invite um, men to join um, a second photo voice group. And then the um, photography exhibit is going to be uh, photos from both photo voice groups. Um, <clears throat> on the slide here, we just have a small selection of photos taken by the guys. We don't have uh, titles or captions yet because we haven't gotten to that part in the process yet. But um, yeah, Richard, do you just want to talk a little bit about what it's been like for you picking up the camera? Well, because I've never been much of a, a guy that likes to take photographs. I kind of look at things and take them for what they are. But I was excited to get involved with this photo voice project because the first exercise that we had, we were given a list like patterns, uh, things specific that you could take pictures of. And when I take the bus to go down to the uh, UBC Learn Exchange, there's a whole part of town that had murals. Says, wow, there's pictures, there's shapes, there's colors. I says, that's perfect. So I spent like an hour taking pictures of the murals. Um, and for me taking a picture, I need to have a reason to take a picture. Like, what's the reason I'm taking this picture? But our, our next project become a little more involved because we're giving things that uh, had more of a personal take to them. Like, uh, take a picture where it, it means this. So what this photo voice project has done for me, it's really helped me open my eyes and look at the world in a different way. You know, when I look at things like, okay, you know, would that, take, would that make a good picture? What's this picture saying to me? And our uh, Jeff, our uh, videographer, he gave us some good suggestions. Uh, so it's really helped me open my eyes to the world around me. You know, it's this whole project is done, but I've really enjoyed it. It's got me into taking more pictures and, and looking at things differently. And uh, yeah. it's, it's sad that it was interrupted. We'll get back on track. I know since COVID, since I've been hibernating at home, I haven't been taking any pictures, but I'm going to get back into it. But it's been a real joy getting involved with something that I've never done in my life. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, so our intent overall is to create a physical resource that right now we're calling a workbook um, that men would be able to engage with independently. 
Um, and so the workshop is going to provide the basis for the resource. And then we're going to incorporate, um, you know, workshop feedback from the participants. Um, we're hoping to include photos and maybe some narratives from the Photo Voice project, um, which will, you know, really help weave in men's voices into the resource. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to invite uh, the Photo Voice participants. Um, so we'll invite the photo voice participants to join an advisory committee. So, and Jesse, the counselor is also going to be involved in the committee. And then we're going to build that resource out section by section. So if the workshop is kind of a primer overview of all the topics that we want to include, then we're going to look at through the advisory committee, um, building those topics out in more detail for the resource. Um, and as you know, Chris brought up about the focus groups, you know, hearing guys in the focus groups say that they've had this um, internal shift in perspective and the desire to change is really important for us because our resource is, you know, focused on men connecting or reconnecting to themselves. So, you know, the resource is focused on raising awareness about trauma um, and, you know, helping men connect their past experiences to where they are today and, you know, maybe where they'd like to go in the future. And, um, you know, Richard and Chris also talked about um, in the focus groups, um, the importance of being able to connect with peers in kind of a trusting environment. So, you know, we really want to explore how the resource content could also be to delivered in a peer to peer group setting. Um, so, you know, maybe the content of the workbook could be delivered as a facilitated discussion. And we know that many organizations like John Howard have peer programs. So we want to explore how our resource um, could be incorporated and used within those existing programs. So we're using what we call an integrated knowledge translation strategy um, to work with organizations throughout the project to determine, you know, what sort of resource would be useful to them. So of course we want to engage men themselves to ensure that we're creating something that is helpful and meaningful to them, but we also um, want to make sure that we're creating something that will actually be implemented by the organizations who are working with men. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I think Chris and Richard are going to join in with their cameras right away here, too. Um, so, yeah, thanks for um, listening to our presentation there. Um, just before we go into, we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Um, I'm just going to make live um, a feedback survey that we've developed. So as I had just said, um, you know, we want to hear from you about what you think about um, the resource that we're developing. So we have a short, it's just 11 questions long, quick little survey. Um, so if I make this available, share now. So I think you need to um, open it before the presentation ends, but you don't have to finish it now. Um, I think you can finish it after the presentation, but I think we need to open the link. Um, and then we also, I have our, um, it's just a summary of the project and um, the resources we're going to develop. Um, so I think that's available now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for organizing that, Kate. And I hope everyone uh, found it interesting. And it, it, it's a neat project. See, what we found early on is trying to bridge a lot of the work that's been going on to set up trauma-informed practice and, and related programs by agencies, training staff, um, preparing resources, but really trying to bridge it so that clients become, be, become aware and learn in their own ways in a safe, supporting way, and from that learn how they might want to access various resources that are there. Um, without jumping into the deep end really quickly and, 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 and without the proper supports. And so trying to do it in a strengths-based, resilience-oriented way and bridge that gap between how men might want to take the first step and doing it in the really strengths-based, resilience-oriented approach seemed like a good way to go. It's, it was interesting in the workshops, even just using the word trauma can really turn off a lot of guys. So how you frame the presentation of the resource and who's going to present it or work on it with guys can make a huge deal. And I think the biggest challenge is how to do it in a way that really engages um, your target audience, the guys with a history of incarceration. What did, 
what what is it that that we can do to make it in a really user format that really they don't feel judged or threatened or forced to do it and that's why we took this community based approaches we're really learning a lot how to process and develop and distribute the resource and the facilitator's guide um, in a way that that guys will really take it on and engage and see it as something useful for them that they can sort of almost like a bento box pick the different pieces that that maybe might be relevant to them that they can then move forward and look for their own resources online or connect with counselors or various uh, supports that different agencies are putting in place and again it's that bridge between all the work being done to set up trauma-informed practice and um sort of guys becoming the way getting a sense of their own selves and what resources they might want to ask for and uh, look into themselves so it's a uh, yeah really interesting project and the guys really resonate i think i don't see questions here so i have one okay. um nicole do you see that Chris? Oh, hold on i just see the resource so i'm just trying to go back to chat okay yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, I just had the resource pop up blocking my questions there. Um, we struggled a bit with getting younger guys in the resource and what we found they would kind of hit and run like they weren't ready to engage in programming. So that's going to be one of our target target groups for uh, subsequent workshops and co-developing the resource. Um, Wendell in particular um, is involved with some programming downtown with Indigenous youth. Um, or not youth, but young adults, and we're hoping to sort of pull them in and get their feedback on how they might engage with it. And that's, I think, one of the more challenging groups. In some ways, they're the most difficult to engage because they've got a lot going on. Um, but in other ways, they're also can be some of the most malleable because they haven't had that entrenched set of um, behaviors really that have been reinforced over years and years like they're tricky to engage but you can make a lot of progress quickly and it can be a really pivotal point in their self-awareness and self-understanding so it's definitely on our list of pulling in some younger guys to uh, really pilot the resource we develop um, I see another question here is um, people are looking at how they might get involved in the in the workshop process, and the best bet would be to email Kate or myself. Um, my email is in the in in the chat box there. It's Chris Richardson at ubc.ca, and we could follow up with that and how we might discuss that. So uh, we're definitely looking for agencies, uh, say members of John Howard or things like that, various stakeholders to give us feedback on the resource. So we that's part of the co-development is co-developing it with the stakeholders who we think will use it. So we're looking for feedback there. We'll also plan to have focus groups with uh, managers or workers at John Howard to get more detailed feedback when we're at that stage. And just also to jump in at our first workshop that we delivered, we had a couple of um, outreach workers sit in with us. Um, during the workshop and we're definitely open to that if that's the type of involvement you're thinking of or if you have clients that you think would like to participate um, we would love to connect with you about that as well um, yeah as it stands right now we don't know when we'll be able to run our next set of workshops um, and you know we're planning on running two but you know if there's interest um, there's always the possibility that we could run more at this stage um, but yeah, we don't quite know when those will get up and running again. Yeah, um, and another question is, are we planning uh, its use or distribution or developing a form of it for uh, those who are currently incarcerated? Yeah, we've had talks with both uh, federal and prison and provincial corrections, and we're hoping with the development of some of these new peer programs where peers go into prisons to help with release planning and things like that, that this might be a resource they might use, so the peers going in. Um, it is a challenge because one of the issues that came up was um, wanting trusting people, and sometimes they didn't really like to be forced into doing the workshop, so trying to work with that issue. Um, but yeah, definitely it is on our radar for sure. And, and there's another project that's running out of uh, CCPHE that um, is doing peer education inside one federal institution um, right now. They're hoping to go into two. So uh, it's a little bit premature for us, but uh, there is potential opportunity for us to uh, work with that project as well to go inside. So like over the course of the five-year project, uh, that's definitely a goal of ours is to move 
inside with the resource at some point in which obviously would have to be adapted slightly but um yeah we're, we're starting in the community and then would potentially look at adapting it for inside yeah. and i see one other question there about gender dynamics um i know we mentioned toxic masculinity because it was a big one that pops up and it resonates with a lot of people but the point being that there are definitely a lot of other aspects to sort of gender and, and male and masculinity. And that came up, I don't want to speak, uh, John Olaf is definitely, and David Cool are the gurus in this, but one of the core things we found out in our workshops is that guys tend to like to know how things work, like, and that notion of a very gender thing of understanding the mechanics of behavior. So part of the workshop involved sort of presenting, well, this is why you, you might act in this way if this happened to you. This might explain why you have a, a hair trigger, or this might explain why you might want to help people or whatever it might be. But that understanding the mechanics of how it works seemed to be really important to a lot of guys. And again, that came out as a gendered male thing where my guys seem to like to understand how things work. And I'm not trying to apply that to everyone, but we've had some other things. Kate, I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna say we're also working with the Center for Excellence in Women's Health um, and they are starting to put together um, some content for us as well related to gender so we're going to be working with them ongoing and hopefully have them more involved like we said the workshop is just a primer and just topics are being introduced but then when we get to the actual workshop things would be um, delved into in more detail in which case um, you know we would explore gender in a little bit more detailed way um and yeah the, the center for excellence will uh hopefully support us in that as well yeah and then there's one other comment on potentially using us with indigenous courts and i think wendell's involved with some of the community courts and things like that too so it's actually mentioned even potentially recruiting some participants involved with those processes to help give us feedback on the resource Again, we're just at the beginning starting to develop the actual resource. So all the feedback we can get is great, especially, you know, from young indigenous men. I think I didn't mention it in the presentation, but in youth detentions, I think it's over 40 percent indigenous. So huge, the overrepresentation for uh, incarcerated youth. So definitely a population we want to tap into. Um, and again, get diving deeper into the, the other forms of masculinity, unfortunately, are there um, members of the team couldn't be here who are really interested in the more subtle different forms of masculine sort of uh, performances or gendered performances um, we're still just working on that right now so sorry if i'm not very articulate in how i respond to that thank you so much to uh, uh, richard kate and chris that was an awesome presentation um i think yeah, clearly people are very interested in figuring out how they can get involved and how they can support you. So um, just to let everybody know who's still on the call, if you gave us permission, we will share the, um, the resource that the team has developed here, as well as the presentation in the next couple of days. Um, so you can watch out for that. And then if you need to get in contact with anyone on the team, they've shared their email addresses. And if you lose those, you can certainly contact us at the John Howard Society and we can connect you. So thanks yeah. so much everybody for your uh, for the presentation today and I hope it was useful to everyone online and uh, we will see you next week. We have Andrew Thornton presenting um, from the Center for Justice Education and Research, which is part of the Nanaimo Region John Howard Society. So I hope you can all join us then. Thanks yeah. so much everybody. Thanks for, yeah, thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.